All right, guys. Well, thanks for showing up. Today, we're going to be talking about backlinks, namely how to vet backlinks and separate good backlinks from bad backlinks. And we're going to be going over a lot of the processes I use at all three of my agencies, so Authority Builders, the Search Initiative, and LeadSpring. And in case you haven't been on any of my webinars before, I like to make these really actionable. So we're not going to be really dilly-dallying around a whole bunch of theory. I'm not going to leave anything gray to you. It's going to be very black and white. And I'm presenting this in a checklist format. So I, I, I just figured what's more actionable than an actual checklist that you can go from top to bottom to decide whether you want a link or not. And this applies to when you're doing link prospecting and you're trying to decide, do I want to actually outreach to this person or if you're doing any kind of disavow. Now, this is the exact criteria I use at Authority Builders, the search initiative, my client facing agency, and LeadSpring. So this is exactly what we use in these SOPs. For some companies, so Authority Builders has the most strict criteria because we're in the business of providing links. We have to be really strict on it. Some, like for LeadSpring, for example, we might relax some things and I'll make sure to point out the differences where you can relax a little bit more than we might because we might be super stringent because that's our business, right? Now, <clears throat> there might be questions. So if you have any questions, there, there always are. Stick around for the end and we have a Q&A section at the end. But in the meantime, if you have a burning question that you just need to get handled right now, go ahead and type in the chat box and then either Daryl will answer it right away. Daryl's a gangster at SEO, especially backlinks. He can answer it right away. Or if it's something directed towards me or maybe something like I better address myself, then Daryl will hold on that and then we'll handle it in the Q&A section at the end. Cool, cool. All right, so hold on. Just a quick drink of water and let's get rocking. So my webinar goals, what I wanna accomplish for you guys is first to show you a bunch of positive criteria that's gonna help you determine the backlinks that are help, gonna help you increase rankings. After that, I wanna point out some red flags that you can see in your referring domains that will, I wouldn't say will, but can get you penalized. And we'll show you which ones are more dangerous and which ones are less dangerous. And then three, give you a checklist to find the links you actually want. That's, these are my three goals and how I'm gonna accomplish it is this. <clears throat> so we're gonna start with 10 no negotiation, <laughs> no negotiation link building criteria. After that, I'm gonna get into five red flags to avoid at all costs. So it's a 15 point checklist that we're gonna be going over. And then after that, I'm gonna introduce you to some free stuff, an awesome thing that we did last webinar that we, we're gonna bring back another version of it. And then we have that open Q&A section at the end. So again, Daryl's gonna answer as much of it as he goes along by you just typing in the chat box. And then you have to definitely stay for the end anyways, because I've, we've done three of these webinars so far, and at the end, these questions that you guys come up with, they're very clever, and I couldn't have thought of most of this stuff myself, the things that you wanted to know. So I think that's where a lot of juice comes from, a lot of the good value of these webinars. So stick around for that. <clears throat> cool, cool. So um, all right, let's get going. In case we haven't met before, my name is Matt, and I was born in a city called Fresno, California. This is also known as the Armpit of California, a moniker we wear on our sleeves. We're very proud of that. Uh, eventually, believe it or not, I managed to leave and went to UC San Diego to study electrical engineering, where I played a lot of World of Warcraft. And yes, I was a dwarf warrior because it is basically the best race in class possible. Type a one in there if you played World of Warcraft before. Well, eventually I had to grow up and I got a job once I graduated with a master's degree and I started working for a company in the Silicon Valley. And what we did was we produced software that allowed other micro, micro semiconductor companies like Qualcomm, Intel, AMD, NVIDIA to produce semiconductor microchips. So basically it was a software that allowed them to determine once you actually physically produce this chip, will it actually operate in the cell phone or on the CPU or on this motherboard or something like that, right? Get, believe it or not, that was terrible. Uh, I was working 60 hour weeks and sitting in a cubicle. I saw the people that were on the top of the ladder and I saw how miserable they were. And so I just needed a way out. 2009, a buddy had given me a book called The 4-Hour Workweek. I'm sure a lot of people resonate with that book. 
And I happened to go to, I was so into that book. I went to a meetup.com meetup where they were just doing book reviews. They would just meet every week and they would talk about the book and their progress, you know, crafting their own businesses. And in that book, book meetup, basically a lot of people were doing affiliate SEO at the time. They were doing a course. And so I just jumped in right with them and I fell in love with it. To the point where 2011, I had enough success with it to sell all my crap, quit my job, and leave the U.S. and start traveling and doing SEO full time. So since then, it's looked like this. I've, I've founded uh, DiggityMarketing.com. This is basically where my blog is. I approached blog um, like SEO just like I did an engineer. So I, I like to test everything because before it becomes part of my process. So everything gets single variable tested. We do. We have test sites, we have live sites that we test on, and I don't assume anything actually is real until it's proven itself in the actual Google algorithm. Beyond that, I founded LeadSpring, which is affiliate marketing media group that is completely set up for building, ranking, monetizing, and eventually flipping affiliate websites. And then I have a seven-figure client-facing agency called The Search Initiative, a backlink service called Authority Builders, which we're gonna leverage a lot in this presentation, and then I'm the host of the Chiang Mai SEO conference, not going on this year, but maybe next year. Thanks, COVID. So in my time, I've built quite a few backlinks. So let's just tally these guys up. <clears throat> Based on my affiliate sites, so past and present, I built over 32,000 backlinks to affiliate sites. And these are all types of backlinks, anything you, you might think of. Uh, to the search initiative client sites, we've built a little bit over 39,000 of these guys. Uh, through authority builders, so we provide guest posts outreach, and we provided nearly 62,000 of these. And if anyone remembers Diggity Links, that's this PBN service I had a while ago, uh, we created uh, 54, almost 55,000 PBN links. So the reason I'm telling you this is in these link uh, service companies, so Diggity Links it started with and authority builders, we had this process from the beginning, and anytime a new customer signed up, we would take the, we would figure out what they wanted to rank for, but they would track their progress. And then we would see, are these links working for them or not? So we can use that for marketing or building a relationship or something like that. It was a process that we'd done for a long time and I've kept it forward to this day. Now the process looks like this. Basically, whenever the link is placed, you know what that person is trying to rank for by just looking at the page that they sent the link to. You can just look at the title tag, whatever, and it's, it's quite obvious if you're good SEO. So you add those target keywords to a rank tracker. After that, you just monitor it. These days, it takes about 14 to 28 days to see a return on the link. And then you start to see some results like this. These are some positive ranking graphs. Now, uh, doing this process allows you to learn a ton, not only about backlinking, but SEO in general. So think about it. If you got a positive result, a positive result like this, you can know, what type of anchor text did this person send and which ones work best? You can know what were their on-site factors that helped set the stage for them to get these gains. What did they do so well in the, their on-site that allowed this backlink to shoot up so well? Or what other kinds of leaks were they building in conjunction with the links that we were providing for them? And then conversely, if you see a neutral or a negative result, you can see were they over-optimized? And better question would be, what is the actual definition of over-optimized? How much do you, can you push it before Google doesn't like that anchor or doesn't like too much keyword stuffing? Start to notice these kind of things. Uh, what other on-site factors were they missing? Did they have keyword cannibalization? Like you're not going to see a ranking increase if you have keyword cannibalization. Also get to see if they got devalued from spam. Did they just send too many terrible links to their site that Google just didn't even care about seeing the good links anymore? Right. So what we do is we would take all this information, I'd feed it back to both my agencies and we'd thrive from it. So we would use this knowledge. We'd learn more about on-site SEO and backlinking and improving our processes and our systems and the way we're vetting links. And we'd flourish from, from doing this tactic over and over again. So what we're going to focus on today is link vetting. So we're going to focus completely on just exactly this process of determining these links that are going to your website and making sure only the good ones come to you and the bad ones stay away. Now, story time. We'll go back to the Diggity Links game, uh, days. Now, there was a point in time, I remember some core algorithm update, it was before Fred, it was one of those confusing ones when they started to get multifaceted and they never 
really uh, Google never really let on to what they were about. But we always tested our PBN links. We we were of course tracking them for customers, but we also tested our PBN PBN links before they ever entered the network. And then one day after these core algorithm updates, they just stopped working. Like we used to have like a hundred percent pass rate, something like ninety to a hundred percent pass rate, and it just dropped down to like forty percent. So we paused. We paused operations. We're like, okay, we can't sell these. This this is not cool. We can't sell these anymore. And by doing this kind of testing and looking at a million different things, we looked at, okay, how are we building them? Are we linking out too fast after we built them? Are we uh, getting them from the wrong place? So basically we narrowed it down and we did over a hundred tests and then we figured out where we were sourcing our domains from was wrong. We completely changed the process and then we were back on track, back up to hundred percent pass rate. With authority builders, something happened quite similar. So. When Authority Builders first launched, we launched real quick and then we paused. And what happened is we were doing this process and we were taking a look at the first customer's results and we we're seeing like, yeah, they're getting good results, but not every time, like 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 60% or something. So then we really ramped up the criteria of the sites that we work with. And then we started seeing night and day differences. And this is when we started looking at stuff like traffic and, and a lot of the other criteria that we're about to look at right now. Okay. So the topic today, what we're going to be focusing on is outreach links. We're going to be, why is it going to be outreach links? I mean, we could be looking at PBNs. We could be looking at web 2.0s and all that stuff, but outreach links are the ones that move the needle consistently and safely today. So I'm assuming that this is what you guys wanted to focus on as well. So we're not going to be talking about PBNs. We're not going to be talking about blog comments, web 2.0s, GSA, all that kind of stuff. We are going to be talking about guest posting, link insertions, skyscraper outreach, we're going to expert roundup type stuff, et cetera. We're going to be talking about stuff on the right, the outreach type links. Cool. Let's get started. Criteria number one. So again, just, just backtracking a little bit, we're going to be talking about 10 positive criteria that you're looking for when you're vetting links for a backlink and five just red flags that you want to avoid. Okay, let me just take a glass of water. <clears throat> All right, cool. Criteria number one is traffic. Traffic, the requirement here is we want 1,000 visitors or more per month on, we're using Ahrefs to determine that, which is actually not that much for, I mean, I'm assuming like most of you guys are running websites. You, Unless your site's brand new, it's probably making over a thousand visitors per month. And uh, this is actually a thousand visitors per month on Ahrefs probably means it makes it, it's pulling in like 2000 to 4,000 visitors per month because Ahrefs is usually uh, quite pessimistic on this estimate. So why do we care about traffic? Well, Google ignores backlinks. They said this a million times. You can see them all over Twitter. They say, okay, you don't need to worry about that link. We probably ignore it anyways. Oh, you can either disavow it or we ignore it and other versions like that. Here's an article over on the right, just talking about don't worry about malicious backlinks, we ignore them anyways. So the, the thing you wanna avoid is, do you want your links ignored that you worked for, maybe you outreach for these guys, to these guys, you built a relationship, were paid for? Of course, you don't want your hard earned money to like go to waste because you got a link on a site that is ignored. Of course not. So the question is how to figure out which backlinks do they ignore? It's, they're never clear on that, right? Now let's go over to another study. This is an Ahrefs traffic study. And basically what they found is that only 9.37% of the internet has traffic. I would say that's an that's a overestimate because this is based on Ahrefs database. Ahrefs is gonna prune out a lot of the like spammy pages on the internet that are just complete junk. So this is probably an overestimate. It's probably much less, maybe half or even more. So the theory is that Google is probably not likely to ignore leads, links from this rare set of sites they actually give traffic to. <clears throat> and, and okay, I uh, just wanted to bring that back to the ABC story, right? So when ABC, when ABC first launched and we were getting 60% like good good results from our clients, when we cranked up the volume, we first started off with like uh, 100 traffic or more. We cranked that up to 1,000 and guess what happened? The, the number of sites we worked with dwindled down to 
only a hundred websites or something like that because it's fairly strict criteria. And then, but then when we reopened again, we started seeing tons of positive results. Like there were no flat results anymore. It was consistent, consistently good. Traffic is, I truly believe, a strong indicator that Google is not going to ignore the links. It still, it still might not, might not like the link in the first place, but it's a, there's a great chance that they're not going to ignore it completely, which is a great start. And that's why I put it as a first criteria. Okay, criteria number two would be traffic location. And the requirement here is basically, is the website ranking where you want to be ranking? Of course, like if I'm trying to rank in the United States, I ideally want a link from a website ranking in the United States, or at least one of the top four countries in terms of population, English speaking population. So, but sometimes it's a fine line, right? So let's take a look at some examples, right? There's this, uh, sorry if I'm pronouncing this, incorrectly, hindutamil.in. And you can see here, let's see, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but the India traffic is, you know, 85, 87.5%, then we go to UAE, and then we get to United States, 2.4%. So like, it's a great site, it's a DR64, gets tons of traffic, 300,000 300, visitors per month, but I think it's also in a foreign language as well. So for this one, I'd probably pass on it. It's just It just looks like it's not gonna help in my geo, for example. But check out this one. It's also from India, um, Hindustan Times. Sorry if I pronounced that incorrectly. This is an English website. I do have a link from it. And you can see here that the US traffic is at 3.4%, but how can you say no to these metrics? It's got DR86, organic traffic, 11 million. One million of that comes from the US. It's, you know, it's better than my site, right? So for this one, I would say yes. Criteria number three, link type, all right? So the question at hand is, where is your link actually getting placed? And what you want is, you only want followed links, you don't want any no follow stuff, you want contextual links, meaning they're in the middle of an article, so like it's in the body of an article, it's used as a reference from one article talking about a certain topic, referring the reader to another place where they can find more on whatever is linked. And it's on the main domain, not the subdomain, right? You don't want footer links. You don't want sidebar links. You don't want banner links. You don't want image links. I mean, there are certain cases where, sure, you'll, you'll take them if they're free. You'll take them if they're cheap. You'll take them if they're natural, which based on the other criteria that I'll give you later. But if you're going to be performing outreach and putting your time or your money into it, then stick to follow contextual links on the main domains. Uh, here's an example here. So this is from business.com. You can see that what I mean by contextual is here's the article, the article's talking, 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 and then here's the link right here in the middle of the body of the article, right? And here's a trick to watch out for. So this is a dead giveaway that this person is just like selling links or doesn't want to give away link equity on their site. So check for like a meta no index or no follow on the page itself. It's a dirty trick. It means that this page will look like you have your link up, but it'll never index or the link juice won't flow to it anyways, flow to it or from it. Okay, uh, criteria number four would be metrics. And you're gonna like this because in the past, we've usually had like crazy metrics that take a long time to verify. You got your VAs pulling their hairs out and that kind of stuff. I have a very simple metric requirement list because I think that certain ones are gigantic supersets of other ones. And if you, you check off one box, you check off 40 more. So here's the metrics. With the HRS, I'm looking at a DR greater than 20 and a traffic greater than 1000, as we talked about before. With Majestic, I'm just looking at a trust flow greater than 10. And for Moz, I'm not looking at anything. Now, the reason, okay, so as I mentioned, we used to check a lot more metrics before traffic became the standard. And if you think about it, like we used to look at stuff like TF or, or divided by CF and these ratios to trust flow and citation flow to make sure they're good. Like that's, if, if the site has traffic, if the site's a ranking, of course, Google likes the site, it gave it traffic and rankings. So the TF and CF ratios are going to be fine. Like this is all supersetted by this fact that, hey, this website ranks in Google. Google freaking likes it, okay? Relax. Now, um, RD, so some people used to check like how what's the maximum or what's the number of referring domains going to the site? Well, 
that's already covered by dr, right? The dr is a function of rd, so that's already caught there. And we have a few more things that metric wise that I'm going to show you later on, but this is it. This is going to really speed up the process by just focusing on these three, three things so far. Criteria number five, internal linking. Okay, so the thing here is the requirement is you want links on pages that have some internal links pointing to those pages, and these pages must not be orphaned. Another dirty trick from link farms. So what are orphan links? So imagine here's a website. It's got a home page like I'll do. It's got inner pages where it's talking about various content. And then you go out and get a guest post on this website. If there's no connection here, if there's no link from the home page or the inner page or anything to get this page, this page is orphaned and it has no power. There's no link juice flowing into this page. So when this page links to you, it's basically useless. I mean, you'll get, you'll get optimization via the anchor text. You might get some relevance, but there's no power coming through it. So instead, what you want is a situation like this. You got your home page here and there's some kind of internal linking that's getting over to this guest post page. Uh, this means your power is enabled and the more referring domains to, to this website you're getting the link from, the more power. As you can imagine, let's say for example, this home page had 1000 links going to it and at this home page links to this guest post contextually or links to this guest post through the nav bar or maybe it goes to the inner page and then gets to the guest post that's a lot more power than you would get if this web, if this homepage only had 10 links as opposed to 1,000 links. So that, that juice will flow to your site. And that's a good thing. Criteria number six. This is another metric type thing. I just left it at its own kind of uh, place. But the criteria is how many links does this website have going into it versus how many links is, are going out from it? How many sites are linking from the site? And what you want to know is, if, are you are you actually getting your link juice? Are you you're building this link because you want some kind of benefit from it? You want to the to take care of the page rank algorithm. You want to benefit from that, so you want links going into the site, and you want some of that equity, some of that link juice to pass over to you. So the requirement here is we have a ratio. We have the number of referring domains that the that the domain you're you're vetting is receiving divided by the link domains. That is the number that are re, uh, escaping or linking out to from the website. And we want a ratio of 0 0.12 or greater. Now, let me just show you this, how this calculation works. Um, okay, well, let me tell you why. There's a, it's a two-fold benefit of checking this. It's, first, it's a spam check, right? So a website that links out 500 times more than it links in is simply exist to build links and is basically being used as a link farm, right? It's also a power check too, to make sure that there's a decent chunk of juice that's gonna be flowing over to you because it's got a good ratio here. I hope that makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, uh, just type in the chat box and I'm happy to elaborate on it. So if we look at diggitymarketing.com, if you see right here, that's referring domains, that's what we get our RD number. And then we look right here. This is, you're on the left-hand side in Ahrefs. You see link domains and you see uh, 1,522. And so the ratio for Diggity Marketing is 0 0.74. And I would assume that you'd want a backlink from this site. Next, let's move on. Balanced anchor text. So why balanced anchor text requirement? The anchor text should be balanced and natural in appearance. And the anchor text I'm referring to are the anchor text from the links that are going to the domain that is you're, you're vetting that you're considering to be linking to you. Now, what do I mean by that? Um, basically, you just don't want a completely unrealistic situation where, let's say the website you're getting a link from is about golf and like 50% of its anchor texts are best golf drivers. Like that's great that it's relevant to your golf website, but this site is highly being spammed. Uh, the only kind of, unnatural links that can create 50% target anchor text. There's probably automated or some kind of automation going on or definitely some kind of manipulation. You're looking for a rounded anchor text profile. And let me show you what that looks like. So if we look at Ahrefs or Diggity Marketing, you can see here, most anchor text here is branded. Here's a URL anchor text, here's my name. This is just uh, 
like no text or this is from image and stuff like that. Uh, URL anchor text. And then we get into some other shit right down here. Then if Majestic is like a little bit better, uh, considering that Ahrefs kicks Majestic's ass in almost all categories, Majestic does have a good view for anchor text. So you get to see this little pie chart right here. And you see, okay, well, I do see a big clump of 12% anchor text, but it's diggity marketing branded anchor text. I'm okay with that. Let's move on. So this is what you're looking for. Quick drink of water. All right. And now we're going to look at social activity. Does this website that I'm considering getting a link from have any kind of social presence? And the thing is, most real websites are going to have a social presence these days. Like even on your affiliate websites, if you have a doing client SEO, if they don't have a social presence, they don't have a Facebook, Twitter, or whatever, YouTube, Instagram, that's one of the first things you'd build for it, right? So most websites will have a social presence these days. So where you can find them is first, you can just check the website's widgets. You can look in the footer. You can look at the nav bar. Usually they link them and say, this is our Facebook page, follow us, that kind of thing. You could also just Google the brand name plus Facebook and then just find, okay, what's the Facebook page? And what you're looking for is a red flag would mean there's no social media account. So that would be some kind of deal breaker for me. There should be some kind of social media account. Orange flag would mean there's low activity. Now, that's why it's an orange flag. It's, it doesn't, it's not a complete deal breaker. Like if you, if you go look at Matt Diggity's Twitter, I just don't like Twitter. Like that's, that's the thing with it. If there's low activity. It doesn't mean that I'm not a real business. It just means I don't like Twitter. So I wouldn't call it like a complete write-off. And then a green flag would be active profile. Like someone's actively using it and has followers and they're engaged and stuff like that. Moving on, HTTPS SSL. The requirement is you should just have it by now. It's not a hard requirement, but this is another one of those things that's uh, you should look for, and it's a, it's definitely a nice to have. If some is if a website is violating a lot of the other principles you've seen before, it's been on the fence and it doesn't have SSL. It's probably time to pass on it. So most real websites should have SSL security on it by now. You'll know that by the HTTPS before the URL. It's an orange flag if there's no SSL. So not a deal breaker, but in conjunction with all the issues that we might've seen before, that's when you say, you know, get out of here. Um, it's a green flag if they have SSL enabled. Easy breezy. Now criteria number 10, relevance. Obviously you want links from websites that are relevant to you. Now here's a relevance requirement. So let's start from the bottom. S sentence level requirement, Nah, 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 nah. Let's switch it up. Let's start from the top. Okay. We're imagine you're a golf website. You're a website completely about golf. You want to rank more about golf and that kind of thing. Um, and you're trying to get a link to your best golf driver page. Now, if you got a link from a website that's also about golf, then Google's going to think you're a little bit more about golf. It's a great thing. Now, if you got did it even better and you got a link with from an article about golf, and let's say it's, it's an article about golf drivers, that's article level relevance. It's a good thing as well. And then below would be contextual or sentence level relevance. Maybe you got a link in a sentence that said, uh, a great review of golf, golf drivers is from golfpros.com, something like that. You got a link right there. Now, in order, these it goes better in the vertical direction. So this is easy to get. Like I can, I can get this with a niche edit. I can get this with like with a PBN, you know, this is simple to get. It doesn't take much work to do this to an article and get sentence level relevance. If you write an entire article about something that, that links to you, you know, that's, it's a little bit better relevance, but if you're getting a link from a website and they're completely dedicated to golf, like there's no more level of relevance you can get. And of course, you, you want to have all three of these things at the same time. And that's one of the great benefits of guest posts is because you would get a guest post on a domain about golf. You're going to write the article for them and you're going to make it about golf. And then definitely you're going to put the link in a sentence that's about golf. Like this is the trifecta here. But in actuality, this is just anecdotal and it doesn't mean anything. This is the only actual requirement. Like uh, I spoke at James... Uh, James conference earlier this year, and we we're talking about some some crazy stuff that we've done with uh, way back installations and PBNs. And this is the only real requirement, but this stuff is icing on the cake. Cool. 
All right, guys, I hope that was helpful. Let me take another water break. And now we're going to get into them red flags. All righty. Red flag number one, post-labeling. You probably heard this talked about all the time. This is a big, hot topic in all the Facebook groups. Post-labeling, what is it? So according to Google, all links should be placed naturally. If you look at quality rater guidelines, if you look at their TOS, they have multiple places where they say links should be built naturally, right? And that means without incentivization. That means it should just happen naturally because the owner of that website stumbled upon your content and just wanted to link to it because it was so good, which happens like never. So what you want to do is avoid links and posts that are have dead giveaways that say anywhere on the page where you'd get a link, stuff like guest post. If you get a link from a page that says this is a guest post from this person or like some kind of marking at the top, well, guess what? It looks exactly like you had incentivization. You wrote the content for this person and that's why you have this link. So avoid getting links on pages which are noted as guest posts. It just And all it takes is even these words guest post to be in the nav bar or the sidebar or the footer. We believe that the the algorithm is just kind of elementary in such, so, such a way. And it's probably checking your backlink profile and it's saying, okay, what percentage of these backlinks have on the same pages where the links are coming from trigger words like these. Uh, sponsored is another one to look out for. Advertise, advertise here, write for us, and links and author, like, uh, right for us would be yeah, another keyword you're looking for, but also getting your links from author boxes. Like it might not say guest post on the page, but if there's an author box on the page, that also infers that you're the author for this article and you wrote it because you wanted the link, right? So here's an example of post labeling. This is a website, Kevin MD or something like that. You see guest posts at the top and it could hit a lot of the other um pass all the other checks, but this is actually one that came up in a penalty review that I did with Rick Lomas, which I'll talk about now. So why does this matter? So I've run a manual penalty recovery service with a guy named Rick Lomas. He's the best in the business. And we saw a high correlation with links on pages with trigger words. So if, uh, if, you, if we saw like any kind of uh, unnatural links penalty and Quite often, and I'm not saying it was all the time, when they give examples of links they had problems with, we saw this come up a lot. We saw like, okay, they didn't like this link. Why? Let's take a look at it. And we'd see trigger words in the nav bar in the footer or something. Now, um, let me just say that this isn't a strict hard requirement. This just says there's correlation with getting manual penalties and having these trigger words in there but doesn't say anything about how high correlation there is. I will still dip into getting links from websites that have these words on them. So I have some DR80 and above links that of course you would never walk away from these links, plenty of great traffic and stuff. But if you have the choice, I'd probably avoid this. Now, a big sub question that I hear all the time, what if there's a, what if there's a page on a website that says these words? Like what if it, what if it's a great website and these words aren't showing up on the pages that I get the links, but there's a page on the website somewhere that says these words. That we find seems perfectly fine. It never came up in any kind of uh, correlation with manual penalties or anything like that. An example here, there's an excellent domain, asiatimes.com, DR79, 100,000 visitors per month. And you can see right here, it has a write for us page. This is where they get their journalists. And this is like a it's like an employment page. Like, of course, it's completely fine. It's a normal thing. Just we believe that the algorithm is just correlating and seeing that, okay, a website has 500 backlinks. 100 of them are from links with pages with trigger words on them. Let's, let's send it over to the manual review team. That's what we think is going on. And, but just dipping into it a little bit, I wouldn't worry about it at all. Okay, cool. So how do we do link prospecting then? So, cause a lot of people do link prospecting like this, they will search Google and they'll type in stuff like niche, like golf in title, and then they find guest posts. And that's gonna hunt out different websites on the internet that have a guest post page or written somewhere on that. Um, you can remove in title and it'll just find it written somewhere on the page. 
Uh, you, you can also do the same for stuff like write for us. But instead, what I'm recommending is first, this is these are the best backlinks you can get is see who's ranking for your keywords and reach out to them. If I'm trying to rank for best golf driver, I'm going to look and see who's ranked one, one through 30 for the words best golf driver and other variations. And those are my primary targets. Google's already told me that these are the most relevant and authoritative URLs on the internet for this particular keyword. So these are my hot, top, hot, hot list for sure. Those are kind of hard to get. So your second tier would be reaching out to the people that link to them because those are the links that actually got them those rankings, right? And then what, what Authority Builders does is, remember that 9% of the internet with traffic? So that's what Authority Builders does. We, we mine that data and we figure out what are these sites that have 9% of the traffic and we just reach out to them. So that's, that's what Authority Builders approach does. And um, if you have the infrastructure to do that, then that's a good way to do it as well. Okay, red flag number two, Wayback Machine fails. So what is a Wayback Machine? Wayback Machine is a free service that allows you to go back in time and look at old snapshot versions of websites. And what we're doing here is we're looking out for PBNs. Did a website that I'm considering getting a link from, looks great, hits all my metrics now, it looks beautiful, looks like a real website, did it used to be a PBN? So PBN's private blog network is a repurposed domain. It was once a domain at one point. This one obviously used to be a hotel. And then it's used for a different reason, basically to build links. The problem here is, and this will make complete sense to you, is that people let them expire for a reason. If, if this domain used to be useful in some kind of way and it used to be used as a PBN and now it's being used as like a place to uh, build links from, it's it's it got expired for a reason. Someone let it go because there was a problem with it, which means you don't want to pass that problem onto your website, right? How to spot a PBN? Usually there's a blog role on the home page, as you can see right here. This is the home page. You can see that blog role right there. Generic themes, like obviously this is pretty damn generic theme. And uh, random article topics. Well, at least this one got that one right. They're talking about casino over and over. Red flag number three. Traffic declines. You're trying to make sure you're not getting a link from a website that Google hates. So basically, it's quite simple. You need Ahrefs to do this. You avoid sharp declines in traffic because traffic drops may indicate penalties, especially recent ones. Something acceptable might look like this, right? So here's a website. It's growing. And then recently it had a dip. It's not a complete to the floor dip. These kind of dips happen all the time to my money sites. Like I, I'm not judging. I actually think they had a pretty good, good long run, um, but just they got hit in the core algorithm update in May. Doesn't mean Google hates their site. They still have 15,000 traffic, but let's look at this guy. So this guy's been through the ringer, right? Complete annihilation at that one, at one point, and then just completely getting devalued over time. Like this is, this is the kind, even though it's, it's making the traffic uh, criteria, it's just, it's ugly. We don't want that. Okay, red flag number four would be spammy anchor text. So what we're doing here is we're looking out for anchor text going to the website that has a bunch of trigger words like casino, bingo, poker, a bunch of porn stuff. I uh, don't need to say those naughty words. Uh, finance, like payday loans, etc. Foreign language, again, like if you see a bunch of like foreign language anchors, then check that traffic location again. Make sure you're getting uh, your, your links from a website, the country you want to rank for them or at least the top four if, if you're doing English verticals like Australia, UK, US, Canada. Now, number five, type site devaluation. This one's a little thinking outside the box, but we've dodged a lot of bullets with this one. Basically what we're doing is we're checking indexing, right? So look at a website's blog post feed to determine how many posts it might have. So you go to the blog and you can see, okay, this guy posts three times a day. That means about 90 posts per month, which means about 1080 posts per year. Okay, that's a lot of posts. Now, what you want to do is you want to cross check that with how many pages has Google indexed themselves, right? So if, if we're expected to see at least a thousand posts, how many did Google actually index? And if you see something like this, where you do site colon domain name and there's 43 results, I mean, Google hates their site, it thinks it's complete crap. I'm, I'm surprised it even has 43 pages indexed, but this is 
this is likely a devalued site. Google doesn't love it. And it's very likely you'll get a link on it and that page won't be indexed anyways. So um, I want to transition into something. We just recently decided, you know, it's time to just do a blind test and take a hundred of the partners that we work with at Authority Builders, one of the, the most ordered ones, and just do single variable testing on them and test them out to see how they're performing. So we wanted to put all this criteria to the test and the test structure looked like this. So we identified hundred of the most frequently ordered domains and we sent links to test sites with the following criteria. If you're interested in doing any kind of link testing, this is the most important part. This is the part you wanna write down. So you wanna determine, does this test site have a page with keywords somewhere, keywords somewhere on page three to five? Why three to five? Because if Google's not gonna put anything it hates on page three to five or five or above. And also, if you send a link to a page on three, uh, to, to URL on pages three to five, it's likely to get movement in these ranges. As you know, like if I sent a link to a site that's ranked number four, it's my, you can send a great link and it might just not have enough oomph to get it to number three, right? So you wanna send it to uh, a page with keywords on page three to five. Second, it's never had a link sent to that exact URL that you want to run the test on. And then it's ranked steady for years. It's just been steady going. It's not like a super noisy keyword that's bouncing up and down that would give you a false positive, right? So some examples of this. People always ask me examples. Um, here you go. So look for stuff like concerts that have happened in the past. Like obviously no one's linking to this Metallica Stratton conference, uh, uh, concert in 2017, right? Or Miley Cyrus Fresno. And no, I didn't go to that uh, concert, but I would have, okay? Don't judge me. So here's how it works. You take your guest post domain, or like you, this works on any kind of link that you wanna test. Take your guest post domain, you're gonna create a guest post on it, and you have your test URL, and you're gonna send an exact match anchor, Miley Cyrus Fresno. And then you're gonna wait like 14, 21 days, something like that and look for the result on the end. And what you're looking for is graphs like these that go up. That would indicate that given everything else is stable, this URL doesn't have any links going to it. You, you basically made a single variable test. If the link is good, it should go up. So let's check out the results. Okay, so when we checked the results, we checked at 100 domains. 87 of these guys had a positive increase. Eight of them were neutral. We're going to talk about that in a sec. Uh, one negative result and four of them just lost tracking. It means the rank tracker freaked out and like you just couldn't read the result anymore. This happens every single time when you do a lot of testing. So let's, let's dig into those 87 positive results. So here's an example here. You can see the keyword Spock concert tonight. I don't know what Spock is, uh, but the link was placed April 22nd, not too long ago. And you can see the turnaround time. You can see the increase in rankings. This is exactly what we're looking for, right? Uh, there's another one, the pretty reckless who you selling for songs. I guess, I don't know. I don't know who these bands are, man, getting old. But link placed on May 1st and you see the turnaround time later. Another one, set list Cole Swindle. You see that link placed and then pause returns. Let's take a look at some of the neutral ones. So the thing with neutral, there are only 3% neutral results. What ended up happening is we actually, we, we usually have like a 28 day cutoff to see if these things kicked in. And what we found is that we just let these tests run a little bit longer to about 35, 40 days in some cases. And we found that in some cases, you just need to wait longer for them to kick in. And it has to do with, it seems like has to do with the size and the traffic of the website. If the website, the website you're getting the link from, if the website has a ton of traffic, that means Google's crawlers on it all the time. It's probably indexing and taking those links into consideration faster. So we, you need to be a little bit more patient when you're getting links from ranking dink sites. And then 1% negative results. This one looked like that, the who Boston were like, okay, great. What's going on with this website. And interestingly enough, you can see right here on this, this, this site was just hit in the May update. And no matter if we place the link or not, it was going to lose ranking. So couldn't avoid it. Right. Okay, so I just wanna recap and just show you like this stuff works. Like we just tested a hundred domains, you know, we're getting great results at authority builders. 
This is this is the exact same criteria we use at LeadSpring, my affiliate agency. This is the exact same stuff that we use at TSI. And just to recap, we looked at traffic greater than a thousand. We looked at traffic location, making sure you're getting links from places you want. Uh, contextual links, you only want contextual links from the body. Do follow none of that sidebar stuff. Metric checks is simple metrics. You don't need to check a hundred billion things like in the past. Make sure it has internal links, no orphan pages. Check that incoming versus outgoing link ratio, super important. You want to look for a balanced anchor text. And social activity, it's not a deal breaker, but you know it's good to see that there's at least a page and maybe some stuff going on. SSL is a good thing to have, not a deal breaker too. And then relevance as well. Make sure it's relevant to your site, at least in the sentence level, but better if at the article level and best at the domain level, right? Best to get all three to be to be straight up. Now, post labeling, make sure to avoid you know, those trigger words. And again, that's not a deal breaker. You just don't want to do it too much. Wayback machine check, no PBNs, please. Traffic declines, make sure everything's looking good. No steep penalties. Spammy anchor text, avoid all that. And then look out for site devaluation. Okay, guys. So before we get into the QA, I just want to bring back uh, an offer that we had before. This is backed by popular demand. A few months ago, we had a, held a webinar that gave you what you're about to see to 250 people. It got filled up really quick, so I, I apologize for that. Like We try to clear out a lot of time for our team to provide this for free, but uh, got booked up really quick. We, didn't, we underestimated the demand, so we're going to try to hit that this time going forward. And so the, basically the offer is this. We're going to help you determine the link gap, which is basically how many links you need to rank against the competition. Let me show you how it's done. Basically, if you want to rank for best curling iron, right? We have the number one guy, rankingstyle.com. Number two guy, goodhousekeeping.com. Number three, birdie.com. What we do to determine the link gap is we create a table like this. And we can see that site number one, ranking style, it's got four links in the DR20 to 30 bucket, five links in the 31 to 40, three links in 41 to 50, and so on for a grand total of 23 links. And we can continue doing that for site two and three, and then eventually come up with an average here. So we know that the average website ranking in the top three positions has 18 links, and they're in these various buckets. Then we took a look at your website, and we see what's your current situation. Okay, so you have nine links in, in these buckets. And then we take a look at the difference here. And this becomes your link gap. This is how many links that you need to create in order to match these guys. But there are a few caveats, right? So number one is, you need to consider domain rating. If you have a DR20 website and you're trying to rank against three DR60 websites, your nine links don't mean as much to them having nine links, right? So you need to multiply your link gap by a scaling factor. And the equation is a bit complicated because DR is exponential function, um, but we've got it all worked out and we can help you sort that out as well. Uh, also, you wanna make sure you don't count stuff like no follows, something I didn't put on the slide is you wanna make sure you're not black sheeping your page. What I mean by black sheep is, let's say you determine, oh, okay, I need to build 20 links to this certain page, but the cap on the links, uh, the links in this particular niche is 14. Like everyone else on page one is only built 14. So we will make sure that you won't build more than them and you outdo yourself and you dig a hole for yourself, that kind of thing. So here's where to sign up for the free offer, basically. Uh, you're going to book a free black, bah, free backlink gap consultation at authority.builders forward slash backlink dash strategy, right? And we're going to help you analyze your competition, see what links are best to build, and create a one-on-one -on -one strategy with our SEO. It's quite simple. Uh, how to set up your consultation is very easy. So step one, you just go over to the form, put in your name, email. You need to tell us what URL you want to rank. Otherwise, we don't know what to analyze and then put in your target keyword so we can see what you want to rank for. After that, just book a call, it's super simple. Like I mentioned, we, we freed up the schedules for a whole Daryl's whole team, which is a huge staff. We basically cover every half an hour, it looks like, every half an hour, 24 hours a day. So book them up, but they aren't, they aren't infinite. We had 250 last time, so we're gonna run out this time probably as well. Uh, what to expect? Quite simple, you're gonna get an expert set of eyes on your site. I don't downplay this when I say Daryl's team is awesome. These guys are all 
accomplished SEOs. A lot of them run uh, affiliate site portfolios and a lot of them do client SEOs. So these guys know what they're doing. Um, we're going to help you formulate a rock solid link building plan. And if per chance you need help executing, executing that plan and rolling out the links that we recommend that you build, we have a special going on to the end of the month. And that's ABC Plus. So ABC Plus is our most popular, uh, most popular service right now. And basically, what it is is what we described before. We determine the link gap, but in addition to that, we're also going to figure out the exact optimal anchor text distribution to send to your page. Right. So it's the complete analysis and the execution of those links until that link gap is accomplished. So until the end of the month, our special offer is no setup fees. Usually this requires $200 setup fee to perform this whole analysis and get it all figured out for you. We're going to waive the setup free so you get to launch for free. And in order to sign up for that, you go to the same URL, authority.builders, backlink strategy, and just need to book a call and then just tell them that, hey, this is, this is what I want to do. And we can lock you in with no setup fees till the end of the month. So one other thing about ABC Plus is as access to links that we call the vault. The vault is basically our golden archive. As you guys have learned before, we do a lot of testing. We make sure that you know, we, we know which domains are performing the best. So ABC Plus customers will get priority and get recommendations for the best links possible. So that's what we try to get you on if your site needs particular domain, we're going to make sure it's the best domain we can get. So again, either way you want to go, if you want the free backlink consultation, if you want ABC plus with $200 off on the uh, set of fees, you go to the same place, authority.builders backlink strategy. Now I just want to run you through real quickly, just some results have we gotten quite recently. Check the timeline here. I'm not showing you ancient results. This is from last month in June. So this is for an affiliate website. You can see they started at 19, got up to six. Organic traffic is looking great since the start of the campaign, doing really, really good, 212% increase in traffic. This is for an Australian e-commerce website. So you can see here, you know, the ranking increase is looking great. This is no keyword to sleep on, 22,000 searches per month. And you can see their traffic is just increasing over time. We just got a report for them saying that their revenue is through the roof. They're super grateful for this. And then we have white label client. Here's just a bunch of ranking graphs. People use ABC Plus all the time for white labeling. So, you know, with client SEO, you're focused on sales a lot of the time. You don't always have time to do stuff like content or backlinks. So they just outsource their backlink strategy and the execution to us and their clients are getting great results. And then this is real people, real results. You probably recognize some of these faces. This is a buddy, Dane, who's getting excellent results and he's, He's using killer combination. He's using content from SEO Content Hero, very well recommended in the SEO industry. And then links from ABC Plus, you can just see their just traffic going. It's pretty much on autopilot, right? And then uh, Mad Singers. Mad Singers is the infamous uh, management consultation guy in the SEO space. So he tried out some ABC links and just boom, boom on his affiliate sites. He's making money finally on this affiliate site. So cool, guys. Remember, Either way you want to go, free backlink gap consultation. We'll figure out what links you need to build absolutely for free. No, no, commit, no commitment, no commitment at all. Or if you want that back, uh, backlink strategy executed, then go to the same place and just sign up for that 30-minute call. Cool, guys. All right. We're at the end. I'm going to take a brief break for some water, and then I'm going to jump on and do some Q&A if there's some questions left over. Daryl, are you still here? Yep. I'm still and here. <clears throat> so if you guys have some questions that you hadn't had the chance to ask before, now's the time. Just go ahead and type it in the box. And then um, Daryl will sort through them, and we'll get cracking. And I'm ready whenever you are, Daryl. Okay, cool. Uh, so the first question uh, from Matthew Smith was, do these uh, requirements change when you start to enter higher risk niches, um, e.g. payday loans, casino, adult? Uh, is there more scrutiny or less? Would you treat these niches like an authority site? That's a brilliant question. Okay, so in gray niches, right, 
you you basically just want to fit in with page one all the time. And in gray niches where you're talking about like casino and stuff like that, and a lot of like the spammy weight loss niches, you'll look at the backlink profiles of the people ranking. You'll see like, wait, they don't have links like Matt was just talking about right now. And in those cases, you want to match. You want to follow suit. And you can be a little bit more relaxed about the outreach links. Uh, to give you an anecdotal story, like there's some, we used to have an approach because I used to own Diggity Links and I had 10,000 PBNs at my disposal. So we would exclusively only go for niches that were using PBNs because we knew we had more and we would just win automatically. So to, to reiterate, like you don't have to be so strict because you, you're also not going to be able to get links like I'm describing for casino sites. So you can be less strict, but the ultimate determination of figuring out what kind of links do I need to be is going to be looking at your competition and seeing what they have. Awesome. And uh, the next one's uh, Greg Vasquez said, uh, I run a site that gets links on a lot of libraries and schools based on the resource we offer. And they generally are image links or on a resources slash links page. Uh, would you consider that contextual or sidebar style? Uh, would you recommend changing gears away from those? No, I mean, these, these sound like they're naturally gained. It doesn't sound like you're going out and, and paying money to these places. They're not the ideal link. Contextuals will kick harder. If it's in in an article, not like just straight up text in there, like it's it's gonna it's gonna work more. But since these are simple, simply coming in naturally, you're not gonna disavow. You're not gonna not have them. If somehow you can try to pivot this over and getting links in contextual articles, that's great. But I think what I'm imagining your system looks like is you you put up some resources and they're referencing it for the students. Like that's that's probably just count that as a great thing that's happening on autopilot for you and don't try to tweak it. And then try to supplement yourself with getting other links that are contextual. Awesome. And uh, the next question from Paul is, uh, what's the sensible ratio for incoming versus outgoing links? Uh, would this vary with niche or size of the site? Uh, I think the just off the top of my head, 0 0.12. It was in the slides before. I'll have to recheck. And uh, how do you determine how much to pay for a link? Oh, man. You know, it's it's the Wild West right now. Like, it, it's, it's hard to say because dealing with webmasters all the time, like, it's a constant struggle from authority builders because webmasters are completely knowing exactly what – what the value of links is to people that want them from. So we're constantly haggling with them and trying to get them to get their prices low. So I, I feel the pain and I know exactly how it is out in the industry. Everyone's everyone's asking for money all the time. It's very rare when people are just like, oh yeah, all you can have for free. It never happens. The question is, how much is it worth worth it to you? And the approach that I take is 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 I I only know that if I'm looking at just general trends. Like if, if I've run enough back link building myself and I can see, well, for this level of traffic and this DR level, uh, I've typically paid over the last 150 links, I typically paid this amount. And so this guy who's asking 250 for me, like, no, I don't think that's worth it. So in your case, like if you were using authority builders, for example, like what I typically do is I'll just sort by DR or traffic or something like that within my niche and then I'll just go for the cheapest ones, right? That's going to be your best bang for the buck. But it's hard to put a number on it. Like you're going to make you're going to make different choices all the time. Like sometimes, sometimes the site might not have that much traffic, but you can see that they're building links hardcore, and they're going to be a force eventually. So you might pay a little bit more from it because you know that link is going to be worth more later. I don't know. I, I'm sorry. I wish I could give you a straight up answer but like i said it's the wild west the price of a backlink is the price that's agreed upon between the webmaster and the person buying it and that's the, pretty much the only standard stuff and uh abel said uh what's the timeline that you typically see for new sites getting links new sites getting links uh, so I, I start link building right away the first links i build are social profiles so i'm going to make sure like we talked about facebook twitter YouTube, like those are the first links I have going to a site. After that, I'll dip into 
uh, business citations. So making sure I'm getting directory links and not too many, like just a few industry and locality. Uh, if it is like has any kind of local area, it's, it's any kind of local search, I'll get some like local business citations as well. Even affiliate sites. I usually put a name, address, phone number on them and get a GMB. So I'm getting some local citations with that too. After that, that's when I bring on the guest post. And the timeline of this is like the social profiles happen on day one. This, the citations maybe that same week, maybe not right away. And then maybe start guest posting by week two. Stuff. Okay. And uh, are guest posts the primary method you use for link building? No, um, but I won't harp on that right now. The last webinar we did for Authority Builders, it's in my YouTube channel. You can see it's called the Link Diversity webinar. You can just search Google for Matt Diggity Link Diversity, and that's that's the entire topic of that presentation. Yeah, so. Uh, if you're asked to write a guest post on a site that's not directly your niche, but potentially has has people that would be interested in your niche, a pet sitter wants a vet to write health info. Uh, is this a good idea or pretty much a waste of time as it's a different domain? Or do you have, uh, or do you write a very specific article for the keyword that you want? That's a good question. So if we go back to the, the slide we had on relevance, right? So there's three levels of relevance and you're just missing domain level relevance. It's not exactly in your niche, but it's something sort of about your niche. But you'll definitely get article level relevance with the guest post and you'll get sentence level relevance, especially if you write that article yourself. So the only requirement again is sentence level relevance. The other ones are just icing on the cake. So it's, it's completely fine. Put it this way, like New York times doesn't have a theme. New York times is a general site. You're not going to turn down a link from them. Right. Um, Lee asked, uh, if you are asked to, uh, oh, sorry, no, uh, Chris on this one, uh, I'm only building links to my money pages at the moment. Is this a problem? Should I also build links to my supported info pages to make my site's overall link profile appear more natural? It helps, yeah. Um, well, there's two reasons you'd want to do that. One is the one you just recommended. It's always good to build links to your supporting content. I believe I have a case study on Diggity Marketing about that. I'll have to dig it up for you. So, Daryl, make sure to note down his name. Yeah, and the other reason is you want to avoid the black sheep effect, right? So I, I talked about this before, is if everyone on page one has maximum 14 links going to the URLs that they have ranking, you don't want to exceed that by too much. You maybe like by 10% on top of that. And so in that case, when you, you got 14 links already, now it's time to start li sending links to the pages that are internally linking to your money page. Stuff, uh, Lisa was asked, are all for boxes bad? Uh, I mean, it's a dead giveaway that you're getting, you, you wrote the article, especially if it's, so, so here's the thing, right? You just don't want to make it look that like you're the one who wrote the article, right? So if you're getting a guest post on abc.com, right? And then it's the author box is in your name and you're getting a link from that. That looks like very clear that you wrote that article and you wrote that article so you could get the link. But if, for example, it was another person, just a random person, another persona, John Smith, that has nothing to do with your website, and the author box isn't linking to your website, then that just looks like another random guy on the internet wrote a blog post on another ra random website on the internet, and that they referenced your, your website in the article to make their article better. That's perfectly fine. Stuff. And uh, would you take a link from a guest post that has more than one uh, to your site of do follow outbound links on the majority of their guest posts? Hmm. I'm not sure. Okay. Can you reread that? I'm not sure. I understand. Sorry. Yeah. W would you take a link from a guest post that has more than one do follow link on the majority of their guest posts? Yeah. Yeah. So that's more realistic, right? Like if a guest post just has like one link going to you, that's great because you're getting a majority of the link juice from that page. But it's no harm if it has other outbound links on it because that that happens in the real world. Like it happens all the time. And uh, Terry asked, um, 
you have PPNs as a red flag, but is it only a red flag as a tier one link, but not red flag as a tier two? Yeah, I would say so. But I also wouldn't use outreach links as tier two. It's just a waste. So, uh, Raymond's asked a good question here. So I'm not sure if my on-page optimization is up to standard comparing to other sites. And creating a backlink uh, will still help to improve the ranking on the on-page, if the on-page optimization is not up to par. Uh, so it just depends on in the scale of fully optimized versus completely de-optimized. It depends if you're if you're in the middle, and you know Google thinks you're all right, then sending link juice will will move you up. But if you're completely de-optimized or a straight up issue like keyword cannibalization. You can send 100 links to a keyword cannibalized page. It's not going to move, right? So definitely you want the 80-20 the of SEO starts with on-site SEO. So definitely look at it like um, look, at, like, look at it like your website is your ship, right? Like that's your boat. You want to make sure your boat has no leaks in it. So when you put wind in its sails, backlinks, it's actually going to go as fast as it can. Thank you, stuff. And uh, Juan's asked... Um, does the link from content synd syndication work? If not, why do people use that service? Content syndication. So, like, I'm assuming it means like a press release. You know, you get a press release. So. And then yeah, yeah, I assume so. You get syndicated and stuff like that. It's a really good question. I'm testing this out right now. Is there a maximum uh, of links I should build each month to avoid over optimization? Mm. I mean, that, that's a pretty good question as well. Uh, so in general, what I'd recommend to do is, I don't remember the exact threshold numbers off the top of my head, but if you go to diggitymarketing.com and you opt in for, on the homepage, you'll see on-site SEO guide. That's going to take you to a thank you page where you'll see a whole bunch of guides. And one of them in there is called the backlink blueprint where I dig into that exact question. Uh, besides looking for websites that have our company's keywords on Google search engine, are there any other ways to find more sites that we can reach out and get backlinks? Can you repeat that one one more time? Sorry. Uh, besides looking for websites that have our company's keywords on Google search engine, uh, are there any other ways to find more sites that we can reach out and get backlinks? So is there any sort of key ways that you can think of to find sites that they can outreach to? So I think what, your your method is is unlinked brand mentions. So like I could go out and look on the internet to see where people have used Diggity Marketing or Matt Diggity but haven't linked to me. That's that's one of maybe fifty different strategies for for doing outreach. Uh, yeah, I mean, wh where do we begin? There's I gave a couple in this presentation. One would be just looking at the people that are ranking for the keywords that you want, looking at the people that are linking to them. You could also just go for any website with traffic. You can do skyscraper outreach. You can you can look at the people that you're talking about on your website and try to get links back from them. The, there's a lot. But I, what I recommend doing is go to authority.builders forward slash blog, and we talk about back, backlink strategies all the time. Good stuff. And uh, what is the best way to increase DR if the DR gap is quite large? Um, I mean... The, your goal shouldn't be to increase DR. DR is just a fictitious number that Ahrefs made up, um, but it's a fairly good indicator of what's the difference in link equity you have versus other people, right? Now, if you want to increase your link equity, you need to build more links. And in general, building more authoritative links of higher volume is going to increase your DR. And what, generally, one rule of thumb that I do is when, it, when I'm link building for my sites, uh, like the, the DR ranges that I'll use is that, like I'll start with DR20, right? I'll start only building DR20 links. And then when my site moves up to DR40, for example, I'm only really targeting DR40s and above. And I'm always like just shooting a little bit above my weight all the time. So, and uh, someone said, I have built a link from a DR70 plus guest post with an exact match anchor. After the guest post was posted, another nine random spammy sites copied the site of the content. Uh, this ended up having 10 exact match anchors to my site. Do you re uh, Have you experienced something like this before and what should I do about it? 
Yeah, yeah. Most most likely these syndicated pieces of content are ignored because that's that's the theory. But like I mentioned before, I'm testing this out right now to figure out exactly what's up with it. But this this kind of stuff happens all the time. And like I run a disavow on Diggity Marketing like once per year, but anytime I get a link from like Forbes.com, it's going on 20 to 30 other sites. So I, I don't see any issues between the 365 days that it didn't do a disavow on the next time. Um, Sam Puff said, uh, would you still build more guest posts if you're not seeing results, even after getting 10 to 15 guest posts? Yeah, but I'd also, I would definitely would. If you're building 10 to 15 guest posts and not seeing movement, that's probably means there's something wrong with your on-site SEO or technical SEO. And you want to check out that kind of stuff. I also did a webinar on uh, three SEO case studies. You want to check that one out too for strategy bug, like what, what could be some of the issues that are holding you back. But another key thing to think about is like, take a look at these guest posts. What are these guest posts that you built? Are they, do they all have traffic? That's remember that's rule number one. Do they all have a thousand visitors per more and um, check the other stuff too? Because like, a, like we saw, like we tested a hundred domains and you know, over 90% of them are showing positive results by following this criteria. Um, it's one perhaps I can answer. Caitlin's asking for booking a backlink consultation. Uh, when you ask for the URL, are you looking for a specific page we want to rank or do you want just the domain? Just want to make sure if I, if I enter the right info. Um, you can give us the the target page is, is fine. Um, if you do just give us the domain, the gut, when they do the analysis, they'll probably look, well, more than likely they're going to look for that anyway. So um, they'll come back to you with a specific page if they've got one in mind. Um, but yeah, feel free to give us the target page if you've got one already. Um, Sam said, do you... Sam said, do you send links to, to sites that link to you? Mm, yeah, I mean, it happens from time to time. Like, it happens naturally all the time. If you look at how many links are going back and forth between Diggity Marketing and Ahrefs, like, it's like 30 or something like that. Like, it's going to happen naturally, and I don't think there's an issue with it. There's, you know, the, I think what you're you're concerned about is link exchanges, right? So, like, if one strategy you can use, and this goes back to the, the other gentleman who was asking about like what other ways can you use to build links is one thing you can do is like check your inbox every once in a while. And you're probably getting tons of people asking how much for a guest post, how much for a guest post. And if they have a good site, then you can just say, well, I don't, I'm not allowing people to post on my site because I'm really stingy about content, but how about we do a link exchange where I'll update a piece of content for you uh, and link to you. And I expect you to do the same. So that stuff is fine in extreme moderation, right? So you don't want a big chunk of your backlink profile to come from link exchanges, but a little bit is fine. And like I mentioned before, it happens naturally. It happens naturally all the time. I'm not, if, um, if I've already linked to SEM Rush like 10 times I'm, and they want to link to me, I'm not going to say hey, disavow that. You know, it's, it's completely fine. Uh, don't ask, what is your typical outreach approach um, from a script perspective? From, oh, like how am I writing my scripts? Yeah. Uh, so to be honest, I don't really discuss scripts and, and pitching like in public because as soon as you say it, then it gets copied and then it doesn't work anymore. But if you're in the affiliate lab, I do share some. Uh, if a website has collaboration part on footer or header or write for us part, should we go for guest post on them? Uh, what are the tr trigger words again? So for if a web website has a collaboration part on the footer or a header or a write for us part i think kind of what you just clarifying what you said earlier yeah i mean that's that's the thing like if it's hitting a home run in all of the categories like the traffic's amazing everything looks great but it just has that like i think it's fine i'd poke around a little bit and just double check and make sure everything's fine um but it, it's not a complete deal breaker but if you have, if it's just a so-so link, then I'd probably pass on it. So if uh, Hans asked, if you start building a new site, do you recommend ABC Plus for this? If not, any other service you recommend? Um, definitely, Juan, yeah, absolutely. We've worked with a bunch of new sites. Um, we get them off the ground pretty quickly as well when we do it. So yeah, feel free to um, submit over the site and we'll, we'll take a look with you and go through that. Hmm. Uh, 
Uh, Max asked, uh, what about outgoing links from an author page that the author box links to? Sure about that one. Um, it, is the question about like, should I get a link from an author box? Yeah, he's saying, what about outgoing links from an author page that the author box links to? Oh, oh. yeah, I think that's fine. I mean, if you're a contributor, like that, that happens on Healthline. Like it's fine. That's enough. Uh, someone's asked as well about building the, how do you build the domain authority of the site? And do you need to do that to a specific page or to the domain as a whole? Uh, yeah. Uh, corollary on top of like the DR question before. Yeah. I mean, building links to a site's domain, just anywhere, it could be on one page, but the, the theory, I don't know, I don't know the actual mechanics of DR calculations, but the theory is that you need to spread it out, but I'm, I'm assuming you can just send multiple links to the same page as long as they're quality and authoritative and do follow, like it's going to count it in the DR or DA algorithm. But best to check on Moz or Ahrefs.com for their documentation. So Andrew's got a good one. Where do you think a site with zero backlinks to a page is outranking another site on the same topic but has many relevant and good backlinks? Probably there's a couple of reasons is on-site SEO. The one with no backlinks might just have killer on-site SEO. And the second would be internal linking. So that, that page that has zero backlinks, it probably has a whole bunch of internal links all the time from other relevant pages on that website, which probably do have links going to them. So it's leveraging that website's authority in a smart way. We do this all the time. So like with our authority sites, whenever we publish a new piece of content, a lot of the time we're ranked in the top five right off the bat, sometimes right at number one, just because our site's already a DR50 or DR60 or DR70. Stuff. And uh, are you putting the same amount of effort into a guest post that you would into a post on your own website? Uh, no, <laughs> no. So like, yeah, I'm not carefully writing our content and stuff like that, but it's something we've considered. So like for on-site optimization on our, on our money sites, we're using Surfer SEO and we're doing fancy stuff like really optimizing titles and looking at entity optimization and check, making sure the subtopics have proper coverage for the query and all that kind of stuff, doing, doing fucking high level shit for, uh, for our own sites. And so the idea is like, okay, if we did that same level of content optimization for the, for the URLs that are linking to us, maybe they'll start ranking for those similar keywords and that's got to be a better boost, right? So we're considering doing that at authority builders, but the, the challenge is difficult. And uh, like, obviously, you know, that they take a lot of man hours to optimize guest post content as well. But it's something we're looking into, and we think it's it could be the future. So we're looking into that. Good stuff. And uh, if all four boxes are bad, how do you write guest blogs, and how do you satisfy eat? Uh, so we're we're talking about sites you're getting your links from, not your money site. That's the difference. Mm. And and author boxes aren't the end all be all on EAT. And the algorithm doesn't check EAT. Uh, someone said, is tier two and, we and free web 2.0's BS? Uh, tier two and web 2.0? Yeah. Yeah, so like uh, if you check an ancient post on diggitymarketing.com, I, I tried something called trust tiering, where it's basically just creating huge tiers of web 2.0, spamming them in the back and then seeing what happens. Like that stuff st stopped working in like 2018. I'm sure there's there's some ways to do it. Like it's a big indexing problem, and honestly, I felt like it still got a trickle of movement in 2018, but not worth the amount of work that went into it. Um, Juan's asked, uh, "Do we offer a link insertion uh, service, and how does it compare to guest posts?" Nah. So there's a there's a few reasons, right? So like. With link insertions, the problem with that is they're also known as what you probably heard before, niche edits, where that's just a euphemism for the word hacked backlinks. So someone just uses a WordPress vulnerability, logs into a website, and then sneaks in a link there. So when they're done right, like a niche edit, the hacked version is no different than a link insertion. You wouldn't be able to tell, right? So we just don't want to get wrapped up in authority builders associated with anything like that. In addition, 
we found that at least through through LeadSpring's own websites and and clients at TSI, like link insertions are great, especially if you can get links on pages that have backlinks, but there's a threshold. If you look at the natural course of the internet, most natural links are going to be coming from new pages. Just look at Diggity Marketing. You'll see that in the the past two months, like the new links that it's got are coming on brand new pages. I I just did a podcast. They're talking about the podcast. I just, I just wrote a new article. They, they linked to that article that they linked to my SEO news roundup in June or something like that. So they're always on new pages, but maybe 10% of the time they'll be updating existing posts. So we also don't want people to burn their sites by going to haywire with that. We want uh, guest posts like are pretty much, you, you can't go wrong. Like if you're always getting links on new pages, like that's, that's how the internet works. Like there's no, there's no failure point there. Stuff. And uh, if the blog that you want to guest post on is a subdomain of the main site and has less than 1K traffic, would you ignore it? How do you assess? I kind of I, I ignore subdomains, especially with no traffic. Uh, for a site with a bad link profile full of spammy links, would you start by disavowing all the spammy links before beginning a white hat link building campaign? Yes. Is one and... Are you a big believer in building links to your existing ABC guest posts, or would you just spend your budget on more ABC guest post links direct to your site? Okay, so PC comment is that I do tiered link building, but I would never recommend anybody build links to our partners' pages at Authority Builders because they literally are our partners, and I wouldn't say I would I couldn't couldn't throw them under the bus and say yeah build links to them because they probably wouldn't want that. Uh, Dean's asking um, if he's already got a link from a particular website, it, is it, um, he believes it's natural to get more than one link from a specific website. So would you advise to mix up between the homepage and inner pages? Um, do you think that would be a good strategy or do you think that works at all? Yeah, I mean, that point. can work, but I wouldn't put effort into it. Like if, if I already got a link from a referring domain, I wouldn't put more effort to get another one. If they, they happen to do it, on their own, like sure, that's completely fine, but I, I wouldn't put effort into it. Um, good stuff, and um, I've got a few guys asking, I don't know if you want to update on this, but they're asking about the May core update. Do you know what it was about? And if uh, a site has dropped, what would you go back to check first? Uh, so I don't, I don't want to steal the thunder from one of my buddies who did a big analysis, but I, I will just say it had a lot to do with backlinks and then turning up the volume on the number of backlinks. I can cross correlate on, on another study that Michael from Surfer did is that it seemed to be niche specific where in some niches like real estate, uh, we had a real estate lead gen site that had a little bit of a devaluation in May. And it seems like they turned up the volume on how many links you need to compete in real estate type niches. But, our health and fitness websites, they seem to have turned down the volume on how many backlinks you need. Uh, so our health and fitness websites are up against Healthline and all these kind of guys. And we started closing the gap and started moving above Healthline a lot of the time. Um, so we think that they turned down the volume in some niches. But for the most part, we see a high correlation with backlinks. And then the second part is, is just like, uh, they could be looking at stuff like website speed, um, People are talking about first contextual paint and accessibility scores and that kind of stuff. This is all stuff that I just file under like do all the things, make your website, your ship, a tight, tight looking ship. And you should always have like a perfectly 100% technically sound site. And then the other stuff is just noise, like Google's turning knobs all the time, turning knobs on what they think relevant means, turning knobs on backlinks. But I believe this last one was backlink related. Okay, Derek, no, I got time for one more. Uh, let's go with, uh, let's go with, uh, if a site has a bad backlink profile where the majority of the links are red flags, would you disavow all the bad links immediately or would you do it progressively as you acquire better links? Okay, so that's a really good question. So the issue here is like, quite often people do a disavow and they drop rankings because they mixed in some of the good ones, right? So the, the question here is like, I do believe you should do a disavow 
And I do used to disavow all the bad ones. The problem is, how do you figure out what all the bad ones are? That's something I'm not even an expert in. So, and it's also a very tedious task uh, to go through a thousand backlinks and try to sort through them one by one. So I just outwrote, uh, I just outsource it to Rick Lomas. He's been doing this for years. He's got software that he uses. He's my disavow person. Cool. Okay. So that's it. We've come to the end of the road. I hope that was super helpful. Go ahead and chat or type in a one in the chat box if you found that this is useful. If you want me to do something again like this, if you have a particular topic you'd like me to talk about next time, yeah, let me know and uh, help me feel, feel good about myself. But again, like I hope this helped a lot. And remember, if you want that free strategy call, just go to authority.builders, backlink strategy. If you want us to execute that strategy, go to the same spot. We got ABC Plus with zero setup fees until the end of the month. Thanks so much, guys. See you next time.